Awesome. I think we're live. What's going on, David? How you doing? Life is good, man. How are you? Good, man. So I wanted to start off real quick with a question that I heard you ask or you use on another uh, podcast. And okay. that's, what's your favorite superhero? <laughs> Batman. It is definitely Batman. Um, and we can get into a much deeper thing about which Batman, but that's a, that's a whole other monologue. But uh, no, I've always liked the... Um, the idea that he's actually not super right. He's not some alien that just showed up without being invited um, and started smashing all our buildings like Superman. And he's not like a dorky dweeby preteen that had all sorts of girl issues and then got bit by a spider. Right. He's just, he's just a guy that was like, there's a huge problem and I am blessed with the resources to deal with it. So I'm going to go deal with it. Um, Yeah. I've always, I've always liked that. So actually I, uh, a few podcasts ago, I was talking to someone named Brad Pilon. I don't know if you know him um, in the fitness space. And he brought up this awesome Batman idea of how to make another Batman movie. Because okay. his idea was, it's too hard to portray this guy who's like so mysterious. And like every actor comes in and we're like, oh, we don't like this about Batman. Oh, we don't like that about Batman. So his idea was to actually take the movie and have it focused around a group of bank robbers. And these guys are getting picked off by this mysterious like creature thing the whole time. And in the end, you realize it's Batman. And that was him. And you had no idea. That would actually be kind of cool. Sort of like, so if you think about the, the Dark Knight, the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight, it opens with that robbery scene with the Joker. Like imagine if it just followed the Joker the whole time through and the Batman was the Enigma. It also, I mean, it's, it's actually an idea that I guess they kind of played with. Like the only, I made the mistake of watching Suicide Squad on like its mm-hmm. opening weekend and it wasn't worth the money. Um, I, don't, I, would, I don't know if it was worth the money watching it free on a plane. But, uh, but the one thing that was awesome about it was the couple scenes of Batman and the Batmobile and, and Jared Leto as the Joker, actually. Jared yep. Leto was a phenomenal Joker. But unfortunately, like you said, it was sort of like the bank robbers thing. The story is actually about this whole other group of people that was kind of boring to me. Um, so proof of concept, right? That, that, that exactly. might be the idea. Yeah. No, I think that would be a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal concept. It would just be cool to see him in a different light. But So we're coming from... Batman's your guy. You love the person who has, he needs, uh, he has the means and now he needs to take control of his life. Is this the motivating drive for you teaching people how to actually learn to network, go through their friends and help people, but also create these personal relations or how did that story start with you? Yeah. Well, okay. So I, so we should, we should back up and do a couple things on, on, for me personally. Yes. I, the reason I think I resonate with that particular character is this idea that I, I look back on even like my childhood and my life, et cetera. And I was super blessed. Uh, I mean, I won the birth lottery. I actually globally, most people, if you were born in the United States, Mm -hmm. there's a pretty good chance you won the birth lottery already. But like even inside the United States, I had a pretty good, I got, I got, you know, uh, I had a pretty good, I was pretty set. Right. Totally. And I, with that then comes that responsibility. And I know everybody attributes that whole Spider-Man with great power comes bears. But first of all, that wasn't actually Spider-Man with Uncle <laughs> Ben. Um, but Batman is the better character for that of like, I was born with this. This is a problem. I mean, there's that realization that the problem even affects him, right? Because there's the yeah. vigilante idea with his parents, but it's still that idea that this, these resources and these abilities, et cetera, there's a, a responsibility to do something about that. So that, that's me and kind of my career. I've been really lucky to be able to have the, the breaks that I've gotten, the blessings that I've gotten to do what I do. Um, and with that comes that responsibility. I also, so the, the whole reason that you're asking me the question dives into a bunch of science around networks and just this idea that we have this tendency when we think about networking to think about it only from a professional context and to ask stupid questions like, what do you do? all of the time. There's even like, there's courses you can take on how to come up with the perfect answer to that question. And like, those are good, but you're going to put a cap on how well you get to know somebody. And the most useful relationships in our lives are usually the ones that demonstrate the fancy network science term is multiplexity. This idea that there are multiple different contexts for connection and our bond is a little bit stronger than just work or just that we share the same hobby. Um, Those are the deeper, more meaningful relationships in our lives. And they're the ones that spill over in in, truthfully, even in a work context into um, more effective networks, more powerful networks. So that's the other reason we're preaching this message is there really is science behind the superhero question. Yeah. Well, and it's also awesome just to see everybody. I feel like 
if you asked this question 30 years ago, it would have been a lot less people would know their favorite superhero. Now that like Marvel and DC, they're like going crazy. Now people have this like amazing spectrum of superheroes to actually look at. No, that's fair. I mean, like, I, I think about my wife, for example, that like, she never cared about superheroes at all. But if you ask her now, it's Wonder Woman, right? Because that so there's been like, there's a movie for every person now. But to, to me, the question is, it's, it's part of a series of questions that I say, okay, if you want to get away from that, here are all these other questions to ask. I particularly like the superheroes one because I found that if you follow it up with why, it doesn't matter who someone's favorite superhero is, just you go, okay, why? then there's a really cool story about their life that you never would have uncovered any other way. And even if they hate superheroes, you can still go, why? And get a really cool story afterwards. Totally. So then, so what are some of the other questions that you would typically use? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, if I'm in a work context, like I'm in a conference or something like that, or an informal dinner, et cetera, I, I don't tend to bust out the superhero question right away. Um, I tend to ask like, hey, what, what project is really exciting you right now? Project is a very vague term. Exciting is a very vague term. So you could tell me about work, but you could also talk about how you finally built that fire pit for your family and now you can hang out outdoors. That tells me something. Or you could tell me about how you've been really, really focused on you know, Olympic weightlifting and now you suddenly can deadlift 500 pounds and that's your most exciting accomplishment, right? You can tell me whatever matters in your life at that moment. So I'll say, I'll ask what excites you right now, or maybe like, what are you, what are you most proud of right now? Those kind of questions. I'll ask, where did you grow up? There's usually a great story you can unpack um, in that capacity. Um, one, of, one of my good friends, I, I, this is actually too bold for me, which is funny, but one of my good friends just cuts to the chase and just goes, what's the most important thing I should know about you right now? Which I think is, is kind of yeah. great, right? Because it's sort of like, it, it's kind of like asking, what's the question you really want to answer that no one's asking you, right? And then the person just gets the ability to go kind of wherever they want to go. And then you learn a whole lot about them that you wouldn't have learned if you said, so what do you do? Which is, it's always an interesting question to me because in addition to all of the stuff we just talked about, if the stats are right, then 82% of people are not highly engaged in their job, which yeah. means they don't want to answer your question anyway. They would rather talk about some other area of their life. Totally. And that's even like uh, when you think about any family get togethers or anything like that, there's always the same questions. It's like, oh, Jimmy, you're going to college. What are you going for? Or it's like, hey, what do you do? Oh, what are you doing now? And it just becomes this monotonous like robot response. And you're like, uh, I still work at the same job. Yeah. Oh no. I, college is where it starts because people go, Oh, well, what are you studying? And then inevitably do the, what are you going to do with that? Like, unless you say pre-med or pre-law, then there's the question or accounting, I guess. Yeah. Then there's the immediate follow-up question. What do you want to do when you get done? Which is literally just the, the junior version of the grown up. What do you do question? Exactly. And so your methodology and viewpoint is honestly just to talk to a human like they're a human and get, <laughs> get into who they are and then develop a personal connection the way that people should be, which is just being interested in someone else and asking them questions that actually, you know, relate to their life. Yeah. I mean, my, my background is social science and particularly for the latest book that I've written, Friend of a Friend, it's, it's steeped in network science, which is not someone's advice on how they successfully cultivated relationships with them. It's let's look at sample sizes of hundreds of thousands of people that constitute a network and see what things are universally true, whether that's a work network, a network of uh, an entire university, a network of friends, a network of a, a town or a community. What are the principles that are universally true? And in doing that, you uncover what is more human about these things. And it's also the reason that like, yes, it's a networking book, but it's called Friend of a Friend. And it's about more than that because the whole push is to go everything that actually works and is, you, works universally no matter who you are about your professional network is usually some extension of treating your work contacts the same way you keep tabs of your friendship networks. And so when you start to kind of just treat them all like friends and all like humans, good things happen. But somewhere along the line, we lost our way and we thought that I'm supposed to use, I'm supposed to run up the count on my LinkedIn connections or my Facebook friends or, or something like, and it just, it created this weird transactional, inhuman, very systematized thing that people are, I think, crying to get out of, but have no idea what to do. Yeah. It's like, I've even read stats that, uh, or not stats, I've read reports that the vibrate on phones is supposed to be like that vibrate that gives you a little bit of like emotional response 
And so these different mechanisms that we're creating, LinkedIn, Facebook, I have this many connections, I have this many followers. It's all, you see it fall apart. We just keep seeing it fall apart with different people who come out and they're like, this isn't me, this isn't how I'm supposed to be. Now I'm living up to whomever I am. Yeah, well, so there's a couple of things here. So one, one of the interesting things and where the research is right now in terms of social media and addiction and all that kind of stuff that people talk about is that we think that it's what's, what's driving a lot of these dopamine responses and that sort of stuff like you were getting at is actually a desire to socialize, mm -hmm. right? So we're turning to this thing. We think there's a phantom vibrate in our pocket because we're hoping that someone sent us a text message, right? Yeah. Which no surprise then that the people that are using social media the most, the super users are also the most likely to be lonely, to be depressed, to actually feel cut off from social because they've been trying to replace real world face-to-face -face mm -hmm. human connections with pixels and it doesn't work. Social media technology like that is a, is a fantastic supplement to your existing face-to-face -face network, but it is not a replacement for. Totally. And so just because you said the word uh, super, it brought me to, again, super connectors. And I did want to touch on the Dunbar number because I studied it a little bit more when it came to cryptocurrency and the evolution of currency and the fact that keeping track of value was when we were outpacing the Dunbar number. But I've heard you talk a lot about the Dunbar number when it comes to personal connections is kind of like misrepresented because it's taking the average. Some people had a lot more, some people barely had any connections. Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple problems with the way that we normally conceive of Dunbar's number, right? So Dun for, for people that are listening that, that don't know, I mean, it sounds like that most, most of your audience does. It's that number of around 150. The theory is that uh, humans can keep in their, in their mind about they can keep track of about 150 relationships and there's there's a couple things wrong with this number number one this number came from um studying apes and chimpanzees and then extrapolating out what it would be for humans based on the size of our brain compared to the size of theirs right Impressive. which is just right away we're like okay there was no rigorous study of how many humans you know how many actually do when we finally did that number by the way it was around 660 right, of just surveying lots of people. And they use this really interesting statistical technique where they go like, hey, how many people do you know named Austin? And then you go, oh, well, I know these three. And then you look at like baby names for those given years and figure out like, this is how many people the average person would know if they had, it's this really complicated, fancy, really? sciencey thing. But the number settles around 660, 661. Um, but, and that would be if we're looking for kind of an average, right? The other problem with Dunbar's number is that even Robin Dunbar himself, actually described it more as concentric circles. So there is a tighter group of around five to six, then you get into a dozen or, or two dozen, then you get to the 150, but then there are other rings out from that, right? So he never saw it as like hard cap 150. That problem kind of came from Gladwell. And I don't think it was Gladwell's yeah. fault. I don't think he was getting at it, but like he popularized it and it's the only number anybody remembers. Um, anyway, all of that to say the other flaw is that we think about it like an average, an average, usually when I use the term average, people think of a normative distribution, an, an inverted U, that bell curve idea, which would put 150 right at the apex of that bell curve. And then you think, okay, one standard deviation up, one standard deviation down, and this is our average. Well, to go back to that 660 number, the curve that was created when we did that was not an inverted U. It was a power law, the Pareto principle, right? An 80, 20. Yeah. Some people had 3000, 4000 contacts in their brain. Some people had 200. The average seemed to be around 660, but the mean was a much higher number, which means that there are these super connectors that are screwing the average up. So the, you know, in a normative distribution, the mean and median are usually the same. This is like, um, I'm probably, so I'm going to get an angry email from somebody about statistics because okay. I'm oversimplifying, but, um, so this is a strong hint that there really are these people that are capable of keeping 3,000, 4,000 and upwards more in their contacts. The thing that I think is most interesting, and this is why I love talking about this, is that there's this other effect going on where the more connections that you have, the more likely it is that you'll get more connections. There's a snowballing effect. As you know more people, mm. more people naturally gravitate. As a new person enters an industry, a sector, a network, a community, it's much more likely that they will be introduced to a person who is a super connector than it is to a person that doesn't have a lot of friends. That's just math. If you know lots of people, yeah. you're going to get lots more introductions than if you only know a few. 
The reason I bring this up is that the other thing I think, besides the inauthentic frustration, the other thing I think people struggle with when it comes to networks, networking, connections, all of that sort of stuff, is they feel like I'm bad at it because these super connectors are so much better. And then they beg those super connectors for advice, and then the super, they tell them what their advice is. But again, if, if you're not like that person, trying to apply that advice is going to feel really inauthentic. The lesson is this snowballing effect. It, the fancy science term is preferential attachment, which is that, yes, it does come easier to them. It's not because they have some magic way to introduce themselves. It's because preferential attachment. And so if you put in the work and you keep doing it and just treating people like humans and keep introducing yeah. people and getting introduced to, eventually you'll start to leverage preferential attachment too, and it will get easier. Totally. And yeah, so you brought up a lot of different points. Um, but, yeah, sorry. We kind of went all yeah, over the statistical I, I map it. there, but I hey. I love it. I love it. Um, so one, uh, don't invite the super connectors to your parties and tell them to invite <laughs> all their friends because your parties are going to go out of hand. But two, <laughs> I, I wonder, and uh, going back to Facebook, LinkedIn, these, these means where we're trying to get connections, but they're hollow connections. Do super connectors, and I don't know if you've ever seen any research on this, statistically have more joy and happiness because they actually have these personal connections, relationships in their lives. It would seem that way just logically, right? But so, I mean, if we're talking about those like power users of social networks, I mean, there's a, it, it, it's going to depend on the network. So something like Twitter is more about building a following. And yeah. so it doesn't matter. Some people get followed by a million people, but they only follow two, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, we'll use LinkedIn and Facebook, right? There's, there's two ways that people kind of use these tools. One is as a digital replication of their face-to-face in-person network. And the other is people get obsessed with running up the score. And like I mean, literally at least once a week, I get a LinkedIn request from someone I've never met from like, you know, Bangalore, Maine yeah. or Bangladesh to come from all these weird corners of the world. And I accept it. And then I go over to their profile to kind of see who they are. And I immediately see that what they're bragging about is that they have 30,000 connections on LinkedIn, right? I know you don't know those people, right? Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, there are people that have 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 natural connections on LinkedIn or, or that really do max out their Facebook with people they know. So we have to separate out those two categories. Those people that it's a digital way, it's sort of an external brain for all of the contact information for people that they really do know. Yeah, those people... Uh, tend to have a little bit more uh, happiness, tend to be a little less depressed. I mean, depression's an interesting phenomenon. We, yeah. we don't have time to get into all of the ways that it can vary in people, but they tend to be a little happy because they're more connected. Connectedness is, is an essential human motivator. Um, the people that are trying to fake it by running up the LinkedIn account, but they don't really, I feel like that almost backfires because now you have this facsimile of connectedness, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have that real world face-to-face -face, and that can be a huge problem. Yeah, it's that weird, like, because I, I know people like this, and they're connected to all these people, and then they're like, well, you know, I really don't want to, I don't want to reach out, because, and they're just like, of course, building up those different profiles, but I know that you've talked about before the concept, and of course, this is popularized by so many people now, which is you're the synthesis of your five closest friends, but beyond that, you've talked about you're the synthesis of your five closest friends, five closest friends, five closest friends, and how these networks, and you've seen the research, actually have that ramification impact you directly. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so the, the five closest friends thing started with Jim Rohn. Um, there's no science behind it, but it's catchy, and Jim Rohn's a, a persuasive speaker, so it, 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 uh, it spread. Um, there is some evidence that backs it up. The problem is that he's wrong about the number five. The people mm -hmm. that influence us is far more. So in the, the best studies of this have been done by two researchers named Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. And they discovered this phenomenon that they titled the three degrees of influence. So in looking at network maps of whole communities, we're talking million plus people, they started a uh, million plus people over like 40 years, by the way, they started noticing that who you're connected to yourself, but also who they're connected to and who they're, they're connected to. So your friend of a friend of a friend, right? Even if you've never met them, there are still statistical, statistically significant and causal relationships between you and them in all sorts of areas in your life. So, um, happiness, uh, which we were, you know, we were, or actually ha happiness is defined as lack of depression, which is a whole fancy, we could get into a whole psychological yeah. angle that we won't, but it, 
but emotions, right? Smoking rates, obesity rates, all sorts of things are influenced by people that you've never even met, but because they're connected to people that you are connected to, they're shaping your sense of social norms and behavior and outlook and perspective in a way that has a statistically significant effect on your emotions. So by all means, Jim Rohn is right. You should pay attention to the people that you're closest with, but you should probably pay attention to who your friends of friends are too, because they're influencing those people that you're closest yeah. with as well. And I think that's a level that most of us don't take it to. Totally. And that's so we, you brought up Gladwell a little bit ago, but he did one of his uh, podcasts recently on Winston Churchill and who his friends were and how that influenced. And so when we don't even think about that when we elect an official or we think about someone in politics, they're being influenced by their friend's friend's friend. And so like if we're electing someone who has bad friends, but they seem good internally or externally or however we view them, then it can have ramifications for everything in reality. No, that's true. I remember that episode. And you know, it's funny in the United States is sort of that most common survey question is like, which of the two presidential candidates would you most want to have a beer with? And like, it's a totally irrelevant question. Yeah. Um, but the, the more important question would be like, which one's house party would you want to go to? Because you want to know who all of the people around them are. Exactly. Yeah. So, so with that, then how would you go about either one uh, weakening, I guess, some relationships, those ones that should be in your life, toxic relationships, but also moving more towards the people in the friend groups and I guess creating that life, that reality around who you really want it to be around. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So in, in my mind, strength of relationship is best measured as intervals of time. In other words, how long an interval of time occurs between interactions. There are your close friends you talk to every day, right? Or every other day, you know, your, your medium kind of friends once a week, once a month, et cetera. You see each other when you, you know, you all hang out on like a guy's night or something like that, right? Um, and then there are people that you see every six months and every year, et cetera. And the, the real question isn't how do you use like, it's, it's not a matter of just cutting off toxic people and saying, I'm never going to talk to you again. Like we, we all have that arrogant person that's proudly announcing that they're leaving Facebook just be, because Facebook is full of all sorts of malcontents. Right. And like, you don't, you don't realize that by doing that, you're contributing to the problem. Right? Exactly. We all have those people. That's not what we're talking about here. What, what we're talking about is just how often am I seeing this person and should it be a little bit more or a little bit less depending on who they are? Um, it's weird having written a book on this um, and my, my wife read it when, while I was sort of writing it. We now have these very open and honest conversations about like other couples. Like, you know, oh, we saw this group because our kids played soccer together. We got really friendly with them. And then when soccer season was over, we have that very frequent conversation about like, how much do we want to keep interacting with this family? Like, let's talk about the family. Do our kids get along? Do we like them? What should we shoot yeah. for? And, and we have this conversation. And I think more people need to do it. The, the weird thing is now we're bordering up against what a lot of people think of as uh, weird and transactional. And, but it's not. It's actually intentional, right? Exactly. And, and the, the analogy I always use is like, if you're, if you're married or have a serious you know, partner, you can't Say, say, you know what? I don't want to plan our dates or, or remember your birthday. I just, I just wanted to come organically. Like, you know that that's going to get you sleeping on the couch. Yeah. You know that's a bad idea. And yet, why don't we treat all of our relationships that way? We do it sort of for our close circle of friends. We make a point to be intentional and remember things that are important and interact with them frequently enough. We should probably be that way throughout all of them. So there's a really roundabout way to answer your question about toxic people. It's really just a case of sort of bumping them down the list and, and lengthening the frequency of time between when I interact with them. And then there are some people in your life that are hey, I, I wish you well, but I am never going to initiate com contact with you. Like yeah. I have a couple people, I, can, I can, can unfortunately name them because they've recently reached out to me. Um, but when they reach out to me, it is, it is that idea of like, you know what, I never reach out to them. And there's a very specific reason for that, totally. right? Um, but if they, I'm, I'm still, I'm not severing the relationship and say, don't ever talk to me. I'm just, I don't, they're so low on the yeah. list that I don't have time to reach out to them. But if I can help them and they reach out to me, I'm perfectly willing to. And that's usually the best approach to take with the people you decide are sort of toxic in your life is to go, the phone works two ways, but from now on, it's only going to work one way. Yeah. And I think, I think that's the best approach too, because um, it's all about where you put energy is exactly what you create. So if you're putting energy towards something that is toxic or something that is doing you a disservice that's bad, but living with intentionality in just about literally everything that you do is the way to create your life, your best life. Because otherwise then exactly you're like, I don't know, let's just do this. I don't know. Let's just do that. And you're like, 
how the hell did I get here? Because I don't know. <laughs> Who are these stuff. friends? Right. No, no. And this is, I mean, this is actually something you see, especially with guys. And it really bugs me is that like, I remember there was a joke on Family Guy, like in the third season where they were doing this sitcom about guy friends living in the city together. And the, the slogan was a computer matched us up in college. Which is true, right? Like, yeah. if you think about a lot of guys, like, their, their closest friends are the four guys they live next to in the dorms. And like, wait, that was a, a computer decided. who you yeah. know? And that's the, the level of intentionality. And, and most of those people are, are not really all that happy with their totally. friends. They sort of want an, an upgrade to their, their social life. That upgrade comes from intentionality. You can't just sort of rely on yeah. that anymore. And so sometimes that means, you know, it, it's interesting to me that people, there's all of this sort of self-help literature and everything about building habits and having strong willpower, et cetera. But doing those things in a community of people that are going to want to ha happen the opposite is far harder than just changing yeah. your friends. Yes. You know, and yet we think like, oh, that's the thing I could never do. It's actually easier, in my opinion, to change your friends than to try and live a new lifestyle with the old friends. Exactly. So, Wow, that brings up a lot. I tell a lot of people, I'm like, why are you still with these friends from high school? Because what you never realized is you just got put there and you became friends because of situation, not because you actually like the people. And then you're in the friend group. And then that happens in college. I joined a fraternity. So I got to learn, oh, these are your brothers. But it was like, do I like all of them? No, because you can't like everybody that you get put into a room with. And then Finally, I lived with some guys who were all on the same track, wanting to do the same things. And that was, that made it the easiest to create habits, to do all this stuff because we kind of dropped it in the middle and it assimilated to everybody. And then everybody strengthened it with each other. I definitely, I think that is the easiest way to make sure that you can get anywhere is that friend group. It's who. Yeah, you're. no, totally. When I, so when I was in university, this was, you know, we won't talk about how long ago it was, but um, I was a resident advisor and one year I served on the floor of baseball players and everybody was like, Oh, student athletes, baseball players. They were the most disciplined people I ever met. And they would, I mean, they were up at five 30 every morning to be at the, the weights practice that happened every day at 6am, et cetera. And I still follow some of those guys. Right. And now they're not waking up at six in the morning to go work out, whatever. But when everyone on the floor is waking up at five 30 in the morning, it's really easy to wake up at five 30 in the morning. When you're the only one, it's really hard. Yeah, it's that positive. I know group think is often like, oh, it's the worst thing ever. But like, it, uh, it depends what group you're in. It depends on what they're thinking. If you yeah. want to think what they think, then group think might be a good thing. Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, it's one of those. I, I've, uh, I was recently listening to someone talk about uh, like Adolf Hitler and Stalin. And they're like, you like this could happen anywhere. It's, we're looking at this major nation and all these people and the stronger it gets, the harder it is to think for yourself, especially to go against like literally the antithesis of an angry mob running. So, yeah, I mean, now we're, now we're getting into like some interesting theories around mass hysteria and threshold. Yeah. Mark Granabetter, one of the network scientists whose work we profile has some work on this and threshold theory and that kind of stuff. I haven't dived into it too much. It's probably where we're headed. Yeah. Um, I mean, not where we're headed, like we're going to turn into yeah. Hitler or Stalin. I mean, yeah. where I'm headed and my research team is headed in terms of wanting to understand better. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, not, not the country is headed there. Just, I'm going to be reading more about it. I read the book a long time ago, uh, the popular mind by Gustav Le Bon. And that yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Yep. that was very interesting to understand how these crowds work. Yeah. There's a, there's an older, one that happened that occurred after the um it was written in like this whenever this would have happened 17th century i yeah. think after the um south seas bubble right and the and all of that kind of thing that happened in in europe with investing it was the tulip bubble i think was the first version of sort of mass hysteria bubble but the south seas was the second mm -hmm. and then this guy sort of started studying what happens in, ma in mass hysteria and mob rule and that kind of stuff it's really it's really interesting and again speaks to the power of sort of the networks yeah. that are around you, right? I mean, we're not, I don't think we are, we're in a pretty hot time as a country in the United States, but I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. However, one thing that really was overly apparent the morning of, you know, the morning after the election in 2016 was you had two halves of the country going, yes. like one half going, how could this ever happen? And the other half being like, how could you not see that this was going to happen? And that is a big problem. Yeah. So that's where like I'm, and I'm hoping that we just have some random party come in and win and because everyone has to recalibrate. 
Like everybody goes, <laughs> like, wait, I thought only two parties could win and you could only think this way or that way. And then they'll be like, oh, wait, we could do other things. Yeah, political theory is not my, uh, my forte. Um, I, I will say that if uh, one of the things that we studied in, in writing Friend of a Friend was this idea of homophily, like attracts like, similar minds attracting similar minds. And the interesting thing about that is that can create you being in a bubble very, very quickly. Just like, you know, the, the, this is really the reason to not trust the organic development of your network versus yes. being intentional is that if you're just allowing it to happen sort of organically, then the people you meet are going to be very similar to the people you already know. And you're going to get very, very closed off very soon. And so when you wake up and, you know, when, when you wake up on you know, November 9th, and you go, I don't know anybody who voted for this guy. That's yeah. a problem. And that's something you should fix really quickly. Yeah. You can still disagree with them, please. You know? yeah. But you, you, if you don't know anyone that has that belief, that tells me you haven't been intentional enough about your life. So I think less than the, the whole third party, whatever coming in, I think just more people going, okay, we need to have intentional conversations with people that we disagree with but can see the humanity in. That will probably help us um, recalibrate as well. Totally. So you just brought up the intentionality of, of finding other people in your network and how, who you are, what you think is going to help influence that or not is to get to where you want to go. Right. And you want to have this friend group. Is it a lot about making up in your mind who you are, your values, what they're going to be once you're there and then going out living that way and talking and finding those people? Or how would you go about developing the network that you actually want to have? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, truthfully, I think it's a little bit of both. I think there is some element of serendipity, not in who you organically get to know, but in what your values are. Like it's really hard to, to go back to that person who has, knows absolutely no one who could have voted for the other party. Yeah. That person, has a very limited range of values that they would pick and say, I'm about. And if they started engaging intentionally with people on the other side, I hate to use the term side, but you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. um, maybe the list of values that they would start picking from would change. Yeah. Right. And so same thing if it's, if we're talking about just something else about like fitness or entrepreneurship or what have you, like you may not know when you begin what the values you want to say are. So I think you look for, I think in your existing network, you look for people who are, are modeling something that seems appealing to you. You might not know how to put it into words yet. And you get intentional about increasing the frequency of time with those people and decreasing it with the people that don't model that. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that, if you lean into being around them more often, you're going to naturally get to know some more of their friends. You're going to naturally kind of get to know that community and then continue to be intentional about that. And over time, you'll start to understand the, the language they use to describe their value system, the jargon that they're using, the habits that they're yeah. building. And so it kind of comes synonymously. I think that you probably can't just make a list of these are the values I care about. And I'm only going to talk about these people, but you can be intentional about these. Pe There's something about this group of people that I'm attracted to. I'm going to move towards that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I see that a lot as well. It's, um, there's these different times in life. It's almost that snowball effect. Exactly. The snowball, it starts to go down the hill and it's just creating, collecting more and more snow. And then it's huge. These areas that the more that you become that, the more that you rely and lie in that area, the more that people are like, Oh, here, meet this person. Oh, here, do this. And then uh, once you start to voice too what you want to do, because a lot of people like keep who they want to be, what they want to do really constricted in who they are. But the more you're like, hey, this is my purpose, this is my mission, you'll like weirdly hear people go, oh, I know this guy who can help with that thing. Not even to get anything, but because they're like, oh yeah, I just know this. Everybody wants to be like, my friend does this, my friend does this. Here, I'll show you this guy. I'll help you out with this thing. And I think I see that a lot more than, uh, than people would believe. Yeah, and I think you can do it the reverse way too. I, I coach a lot of people to start asking the question, who do you know in blank, with blank mm -hmm. being that thing that you're trying to get closer to. Could be a job or a company, could be an industry, could be a city, right? Could be a, a hobby, what it, whatever it is. Because the, the idea is, you know, you have your, first of all, you don't have a network, you don't own a network, you can't grow a network, it's not yours, you exist inside of one. Mm -hmm. And one of the fundamental problems is that we're really bad at seeing who's who is connected to people that aren't connected to us we can see if like if i know jim and jim knows mary and you know and i know mary i can see that relationship if i don't know mary 
then I can't see the gym is connected to Mary, right? So we have to, which is, those are weird names to just make up on the spot, but you get what I mean. Um, So we have to be very intentional about asking, who do you know in blank so that you can start uncovering, I call it the fringes of the network, the people that you can't see the hidden network that's there and you're one introduction away from them, but you don't know yet, right? So yes, people will pro-offer those those things to you, but you can also get a little bit more, um, you get a little bit faster by asking the question regularly. Who do you know in this? Yeah. Yeah. It's that concept. Uh, I, I talk about using your resources. Like once you realize like, Oh, the sun's good for you. And you're like, wow, it's amazing that I have this patio outside that I can go get the sun at every day. It's like these things that you don't even like realize you have available until you start to look for that. And like intentionally, which again goes back to intentional action. Yes. Although the sun's also super bad for you, but that's a whole <laughs> other monologue. Um, so I did want to get into, I have, Something that I like to ask all my guests, which is what is a higher leverage skill that helped you get to where you are? And that doesn't have to be, I I don't want it to be relationship building and development because of course that's what this whole uh, podcast is about. But instead it's something that you could have learned in any field. It could be a mindset or it could be an actual skill that has helped you get to where you are now. And that can be something like learning to learn or it could be learning to breathe better because if you learn to breathe better, you can do basically most physical things better but something that now you can apply. And if you picked it up and put it somewhere, you know, it would help you. Yeah. So, um, I, my value proposition to the world really is that, um, I know how to read those boring academic peer reviewed journal articles that nobody reads. Right. Um, and I did that intentionally. Like I fell in love with social science writers like a Gladwell. And so I went to graduate school to learn how to do that. Right. And now that's what my writing does. I like to say, that I'm trying to get great ideas out of the ivory tower and into the corner office or the co-working space or the coffee shop, wherever work is getting done. I'm trying to take these good ideas that are complicated and and jargon laden and put handles on them and turn them into tools. Now the other thing, so that that's me and that's what I, the the skill that I personally developed, the principle behind that skill is is actually one that we talk about in, in friend of a friend. It's this idea of bridging a structural hole, a gap in between two communities that aren't talking to each other or aren't talking to each other enough. And being that person that's allowing information to flow both ways can be an, an incredibly valuable service that you're providing to the people around you, but that value will also spill back over onto you um, and you'll be rewarded for creating that value. So being that broker between two communities, that's what I'm trying to do and that's what I see most really successful people uh, do is somehow broker a connection between groups that wouldn't otherwise be talking to each other. Awesome. That is awesome. I mean, essentially you're doing that in both ways because reviewing the scientific research that no one wants to do is bridging the gap between like the guy who's all day looking at statistical analysis and data charts and the person who's like, man, I just really don't know how I can like go meet this person or do this easy to do thing. Right. No, precisely. There, there is, um, there's a big gap. Ac- academics are incentivized to talk to other academics. And unfortunately the world needs the benefit of their research, but it doesn't, the academics don't even know how to talk to the world anymore. Um, And the world doesn't know how to talk to academics and isn't going to take the time because I mean, geez, Netflix, right? So, so (laughs) that's a, that's a whole other problem, right? So being that person, being that bridge between them is, is the way that I've created value and it can work for pretty much anything else. It doesn't mean you've got to go read a bunch of scientific journals, just who are the communities that aren't connected or aren't as connected as they should be that you can be that linchpin between uh, is an incredibly valuable way to create, to create value in the world. And then that will in turn turn into value for you. Yes, that is awesome. So is there anything that you're currently questioning? And that would be, it could be politics, religion, life, how doorknobs work, doesn't matter. It's whatever that you think or have been thinking about lately that you're like, I just don't think it works that way. Or why does it work that way? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm questioning. I, one of the, I stumbled into this in part of the being, uh, uh, one, one foot in academia. I stumbled into this fascinating book that was published. I almost 10 years ago now, I think called the half life of facts, which is about how in any given field, half of the things that are facts in 2018 will eventually be proven untrue or obsolete. Right. Wow. Yeah, no, no, no. And, it's, and, it's, and when I say untrue or obsolete, I mean like Newtonian physics, for example, right, was, is very, very good if you're just dealing with like stuff on earth. But when things get really big or really, really small, like nuclear, you need Einstein and his ideas, right? So it wasn't that they got proven sort of untrue, like that was a bold faced lie, but just 
in certain fields, it's totally obsolete, right? So it's, it's little stuff like that, but it's really quite interesting. This also, by the way, explains why every five or six years, eggs move from being bad for you to good yes. for you. We just keep going back and forth. Um, and so it, it's not a it's not a specific thing I'm questioning, but it, it ever since sort of stumbling upon that, it always makes me start to wonder like, okay, which of these things are not going to stand the test of time. Right. Totally. And when you, whenever you see people like, especially in health, in the health and nutrition space, there's a whole lot of people that are targeting medicine or big pharma or whatever. And then, you, and then they're targeting it with new studies. And yes, that's promising. On the other hand, like, well, yeah, but your study is a sample size of like 75 people. So I have, it's a pretty good indication that this is going to be on the half that gets proven untrue. So, so maybe let's be a little bit more, yeah. you know, a little bit more cautious before we do those certain things. So it kind of leads to a lifetime of questioning, which is really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. I love that. That's like, cause there's, if you, uh, you know, studying the dualistic nature of reality, like a lot of people see the truth in this or that, but that's actually on a subject level, like with different types of physics, uh, atomic versus nuclear. That is, it's a really cool way of looking at things though, is to understand that. Yeah, no. And there's a, there's a really solid, um, a really solid book too, from about, uh, maybe six years ago called the opposable mind by Roger Martin, who's an intellectual hero of mine, academic, but intellectual yeah. hero of mine. And it's about how do you hold those two seemingly contradictory mental models of the world in your mind at the same time and come up with something that doesn't make you choose either or, you know, like Stephen Covey was probably the person that popularized the idea of like, it's yes and not either or, but mm -hmm. the opposable mind is more like, okay, great. How do you do that? Yeah. Right? Which is really solid. Yeah. Oh man. This is like something that I often, I think about so much. I'm huge into meditation. So a lot of, uh, it is analyzing my thoughts and then trying to either get rid of them, change them, or it depends what type of meditation I'm doing at the time. But so besides that, which you were questioning the half-life of facts, are you obsessed with anything right now? Am I obsessed with, well, I mean, I've been fairly obsessed with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the last yeah. like 12 years. Um, so that's probably my answer actually. Awesome. I can just stop there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. I took a bit of, uh, Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the same gym, they kind of like gave samples of all the different types of, uh, martial arts, Jiu Jitsu being one of them. And, you know, I had my shoulder feel good a couple of times with some of my buddies. So, but <laughs> I, I loved the, the puzzle like nature that the mind has to go through to figure out jujitsu. Well, it's a, it's a matter of sort of relearning how to move. Like your, mm -hmm. your, your body fundamentally learned how to move in a way that's about how you navigate your space and how you move objects and that sort of stuff. It didn't learn how to move in combat yes. and how to do that is a different type of movement. Totally. Um, and so little things like that, like that's what we see white belts kind of have to overcome all the time is your natural reaction in this moment with me sort of mounted on top of you, potentially raining down punches, like your natural reaction is the worst thing you could do in this yes. situation. Right. Um, and so relearning that habit is a, uh, it's a long, uh, long, long learning curve, but it's a fascinating one. Yeah. It's the, the disconnect too, with the lower half of our bodies. I feel like most people they're like, yeah, I got legs down there. And they're just like, they yeah. walk around. They're like, my ankles hurt because I'm wearing bad shoes. My knees don't really feel good. You know, I'm stiff on my hamstrings. And then they just act like, yeah, that's not really part of me though. You know? Oh yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I, so like, it's fascinating to me because like I have a, a six-year-old and a four-year-old and so I've been able to watch them and like, you know, my four-year-old is perfectly content to be on the ground playing with cars in a deep squat yeah. that most humans, most grown humans probably can't even get into, let alone hold it for as long as he can. Right. Um, and yet that's kind of how we were supposed to function. Not all yeah. cultures. That's true. It's mostly North America and Europe that are suffering from that. Right. Yeah. So little things like that. Yeah. Are just fascinating. Yeah. It's so cool. Well, David, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I do want to ask where people can find you before we go. Yeah. I, well, I mean, the, the best place if you're listening to this show is the show notes for this episode because you're already familiar yes. with them. Austin wants you to go to that page anyway. <laughs> He's going to link to places like davidberkus.com and to the book and like the seven others I gave him for his summer reading list. Um, so I truthfully go there. That's the single best place to go. Awesome. Yeah. And I will. I'm linking out to basically all of your social platforms and just about everything like that on that page. But cool. besides that, friend of a friend, brand new book, 
uh, phenomenal. And right now, the thing that sticks on my mind from this interview is multiplexity. And I'm probably going to plaster that like all over somewhere because I just love that word and the concept behind it. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm with you. It's a, it's a fascinating concept and a word that can help you sound really smart in conversations. Yeah. So, yeah. So say it five times today to people that you meet on the street and see if they like you or if they think that you're uppity in your nose. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.